welcome to today's session. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Mark Brooks from Cambridge who will tell us about ancient nuclear symmetry. Uh, okay, well, uh, thank you again for uh, putting up with me for a second time. You still have to see me once more tomorrow. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a recent, well, it's a recent meaning 2019 paper. Oh, I think the resizing doesn't, maybe doesn't work that well. Let's see, 2019. Um, 2019 paper with, with Barron. Uh, so here we give um, quite a general construction. Uh, I like to say it's a construction of, of mirror pairs, but it's, it's somewhat more general than that. In certain cases, it gives uh, uh, gives mirrors. Now, what I like about this particular work is that a lot of what uh, Berndt and I have done involves quite a lot of machinery that requires, or a lot of data structures like uh, um, scattering diagrams and so on, that take a certain amount of time to explain in lectures. Uh, and as a result, it's, it's hard to get sort of the full ideas across in, in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, the advantage of this particular approach is that not much background has to actually be explained. Uh, though, of course, giving proofs is, is another story. Uh, so what's the basic goal? Is to construct the possibly homogeneous coordinate ring in general, just the, I mean, the coordinate ring. Of the mirror. Directly. OK, so that's a rather vague statement, so I need to make this somewhat more precise. Uh, so let's talk about what we're going to start with. So starting data. Uh, so we start with XD is going to be a pair. With X a non-singular projective variety. And D contained in X, a simple normal crossings divisor. And then we're going to consider two cases. So the first case is uh, where Kx plus D, the canonical or the logarithmic um, canonical class Kx plus D is either Neff or anti-Neff. So what does this mean? Neff means kx plus d dot a is greater or equal to zero for all effective curve classes. A and anti Neff is the same thing except uh, less than or equal to zero. So there's always a definite sign. So that's the first case uh, which our construction is going to apply. The second case is uh, the so-called log Glaubiau case. And in this case, if we write D as summation, say I equal one to S, D I into its decomposition to irreducible components, uh, the log Calabiao case is when we can write Kx plus D as a non-negative linear combination of the Dx. Uh, so maybe I should write linear equivalence here. And one way to think about this is uh, I either exists of nowhere vanishing 
Uh, this is approximately correct. I know we're vanishing. Holomorphic n form, where n is the dimension, uh, n form omega on x minus d with it were simple poles. along the di. So of course, uh, having this nowhere vanishing hallmark the n form is the Clabiao condition. Uh, so x minus d should be Clabiao. And then we place some kind of constraint about how badly omega can, can degenerate along the boundary. OK, and I, I should emphasize here that this represents a choice. Uh, which you should think of as being fixed uh, as we go forward. Okay, so what are we going to do with the starting data? Uh, we are going to construct a ring. Which I'll write as R of XD. Uh, which in some nice cases, in particular uh, in the law of case, should be the ring of regular functions. of the mirror to the wall call the pair XD. Now, think of this as, I mean, there are a couple of ways of thinking about this. Uh, sometimes I like to write this as QH zero of XD is a kind of relative quantum cohomology in degree zero. Uh, but this implies the existence of a higher degree version of this, a QH star of XD. And as of yet, we do not have a construction of such. Um, another uh, way to think about this is, so this is all in quotes here, uh, is maybe also as the degree zero symplectic cohomology of X minus D. Um, so that's just motivating intuition if you're a symplectic geometer. Uh, that's the kind of thing we're aiming for. But this is a purely algebraic construction and will not probably always agree with symplectic cohomology. Okay. Um, so let's just get on with this construction. Are there any questions? Um, I should stop. Yeah, okay, well, let's give some details. Okay, so just to make life a little bit simpler, um, it's not necessary, but I'm going to assume all strata intersection of I and I of DI are connected. So here I is just any subset index set inside the set of indices for the, the DIs. We have S connected components. Uh, so for example, um, P2 with a line plus a conic That sounded like a boat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that was coming from. Uh, it almost sounded like people on the boat. I don't uh -huh. know. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, line plus conic, uh, if you intersect the two, two divisors, you get something disconnected. So this is not allowed. Uh, anyway, in general, that's not a serious restriction because you can do some blow-ups and, and add some, some target blow-ups. 
Okay, so once I have this, uh, let me define the uh, the tropicalization of the pair. So I think you've probably well seen some tropicalization before, but um, uh, let me just review because it's really quite simple. Let me uh, define a few auxiliary uh, groups. So div d of x is the set of divisors, a group of divisors. Supported on D, uh, divisors on X supported on D. So that's just the direct sum I equal one to S of Z DI, linear combinations of the DIs. Uh, div D of X dual is just the uh, dual lattice. And div D of X dual R is the corresponding vector space. Okay, so I'm going to build a tropicalization or what sometimes might be referred to as the dual intersection complex of the pair XD inside this vector space. Uh, so let's take sigma of x to find sigma of x to be um, just the set of cones of the form summation i and i, r greater than zero, di star, di star being one of the generators of the dual space. So we take the cone generated by the di stars. Uh, where I runs over subsets of one through S, the index set for the boundary components with intersection of all strata, all irreducible components, DI for I and I should be non-empty. Okay, so this is a collection of, of cones. And uh, uh, to find the support is just the union of sigma and sigma of x, um, sigma. Okay, so this is the tropicalization. Sigma of x is the tropicalization of x. Let's do a simple example. So here's my favorite examples. We take P1 cross P1, uh, which I think of as a toric variety. So I take this with respect to the toric boundary. Now I choose a point on one of these uh, boundary divisors and I blow it up. So I get um, picture that looks like this, and now an exceptional curve that looks like this. And uh, so that gives me an X and a D, which is the strict transform of the toric boundary. Uh, so in other words, uh, the D is, is what's in red. It doesn't include the exceptional curve. Okay, now if I give, um, give these boundary compounds names, D1, D2, D3, D4, then sigma of X in this case just looks like, well, it looks like the fan for P1 cross P1 abstractly. But one should, of course, bear in mind that this is only piecewise linear. It's not sitting inside R2, rather it's sitting inside some four-dimensional vector space. Uh, so you shouldn't think of this as having a linear structure, unlike the fan for any, for P1 cross P1 in particular. Okay, so that's an example of a tropicalization. Um, 
Okay, so uh, passing to the general theory. So in case one, this is the curly x from Van's talk, right? Uh, sorry. Um, what what was the the uh, the word the the which of Baron's talk? The curly that was a curly X associated to like Artin fan. Is this uh, so so this is the purely combinatorial. So the Artin fan is a, is an algebraic stack which captures the same combinatorics. Uh, this is just purely the combinatorial gadget. So a polyhedral cone complex. It was trop X in my talks. Okay. Oh, I used sigma. Yes, I should have said. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Ah, okay, trop. Yeah. Yes, which is less safe than you trop. Right. It's it's less than you trop. It's not as much. There's also a you trop that. Uh, was introduced in GHK and many other places probably. Uh, yeah, so the, the U-TROP uh, in terms of um, valuations. Um, so, so this thing could be bigger uh, if, the, if we're in a non-minimal situation, I think. Sorry, yes, I, I should have said tropics. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it is indeed tropics. Um, okay, so in case one, uh, let me just give this a new name. Take B to be just the support and uh, take P uh, to be uh, sigma of X. Uh, so I'm just giving these things a new name. But in case two, I'm going to take a slightly smaller set. So P will be the set of all cones, summation I and I, R greater or equal to zero, DI star in sigma of X, such that AI equals zero for all I and I. What was AI? Well, let's just remember in case two, the case two is the log called the out case. We made a choice of a representation of Kx plus D as some linear combination of the boundary divisors Di. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out all information about the divisors where AI is bigger than zero and only those divisors along which the uh, uh, end form has, uh, actually does have a simple pull. Uh, so this is, is uh, more of what um, I think in, in Tony's talk would have been neutral. Uh, so that is sometimes called the conservator Solomon skeleton. And, and so B is, is, is the support of this, of sigma and P sigma. So this is the conservator Solomon skeleton. And it depends on choice. If there is a choice, It depends on this choice of Kx plus D being linear equivalent to AI DI. So it depends on the choice of this, this representation. Okay, so this is the general combinatorial setup. Um, now in both cases, We can take a look at the integral points on this dual intersection complex on this tropicalization. Uh, this just B intersect uh, the lattice div D of X dual. Now, the final choice information is, is something akin to the Nova covering. Um, we're going to choose also
a monoid P, a submonoid, inside the integral second homology of X. So that just means it's close in tradition, uh, but not necessarily subtraction. First of all, P is finally generated. Saturated submonoid. That's generated by a fi finite number of, of elements. Everything can be written as a positive linear combination of a finite number of elements. Um, it's saturated, meaning that uh, if n times p is in p, then n then p is in p. So n greater equal to so n greater than zero. Okay, the second condition is that P intersect is negative inside H over two uh, should just consist of the torsion part. So the only invertible elements of the monoid should be torsion elements in H over two. It's relatively rare that you have torsion, so it's not really so important. And the third condition is that P contains uh, the class of every effective. every effective curve on X. Actually, you can probably get away with less, but it's just convenient to uh, um, convenient to, to write this. So think spec K bracket P is the Kähler Magi space. Again, this is just a slogan. The spec K bracket P is some toric variety, uh, affine toric variety, and um, you should think of this as being analogous to the, the Kähler Magi space, where if you're familiar with the old physics terminology for these things, the zero dimensional stratum would be both was called a large radius uh, limit. Okay, uh, a little bit more notation. Let's take M to be the maximal monomial ideal. That's P minus the invertible elements in P. And choose any ideal fix an ideal I contained in P who's radical equal to M. So in other words, another way to think about that is that um, uh, IE uh, A, sorry, K bracket P mod I is our tinium. Okay, so this is a truncation. Really, I think the way to think about this is, is to think of formally uh, where we're really going to complete this, this ring. Uh, but it's really more convenient to go to, to work to some finite order, a finite number of curve classes. So now set, uh, set AI to be K bracket P mod I, that's obtaining the ring. And now I'm ready to define the order I version of the ring I'm trying to get. In fact, that's really the only thing I define. Ri of xd is defined to be a direct sum over P and B of Z of Ai times a generator theta P. So this is a free module. Free AI module. We have one generator for each integral point on B. And I should indicate that this theta, if you were typesetting this, 
this would be var theta. This is the theta that's used in the notation for theta for abelian theta for sorry for theta functions on abelian varieties, and we view these as a generalization of such. If we were with a proper setup, you can recover uh, uh, classical theta functions on abelian varieties. Okay, so what I haven't really done anything so far. I've just set up some notation and I've defined this this completely trivial free module over AI. There's no content yet. The content it comes from turning this into an AI algebra. The key point. We need to turn RI of XD into an AI algebra. And that means I need to tell you how to multiply theta functions. So the goal, define a product rule by telling you what happens when you multiply theta functions, theta P, and theta Q. Uh, and this will be some sum over R in B of Z and some structure constant alpha p q r theta r and here alpha p q r should lie in a i okay so that's just saying what what i need to do i need to define some alpha p q r structure constants and furthermore i'm going to write alpha p q r as a sum over curve classes so a and p minus i of n superscript a p q r t to the a. So here t to the a is my notation. This is the element of k bracket p corresponding to a. So just think of k bracket p. Maybe I should have spelled this out. k bracket p is direct sum over p and p of k times t to the p. Okay, so this is just my, my notation for uh, uh, the generators of k bracket p. Okay, so again, I haven't done anything because all I'm doing is saying, well, this is what I want. If I can find some nice alpha pqr, I do that by finding some nice uh, coefficients na pqr. So now comes the job of actually defining NA EQR. So now we have a new goal. Find a good choice of NA PQR. Now, here's the basic picture. So this will be a count. It's going to be intuition, a count of three pointed punctured maps to X with contact orders P, Q, and minus r. Now, I'm not sure how much of this language was was de developed by Berendt in his first talk. I, I didn't get a chance to hear his first talk on Monday. So maybe I'll say a little bit about this. Um, so we have some moduli space. More precisely, Is this a moduli space? Uh, right, as m of x beta of uh, puncture maps. Um, so these will be maps from some curve C with three marked points, or as xp, xq, xr. X 
such that F has contact order. All right, as as D I um, paired with P along D I at X P. So what do I mean here? So remember, um, P is a point on B. B lives in the dual vector space to the, the space of uh, divisors on uh, Spartan on D. So DI is a linear functional on B. DI defines a function on B in particular evaluates to give something on, uh, give, give an integer on P. Okay, so P tells us uh, specifies a contact order, degree of tangency of this curve of XP um, along each divisor. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be a bit more specific in a second. Um, and so let me finish this. So it has contact order DIQ, again, the same words along DI. XQ and contact order uh, minus DI R long DI at XR. So here, this minus really fits into the punctured contact square. Punctured curves can have both positive and negative contact orders uh, with divisors. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's go back to this uh, example I, I introduced earlier. Here we have something like this. Uh, and we could take uh, P to be, uh, let me label the boundary divisors, uh, let's take P to be D2 star, uh, Q to be D4 star, and R to be D1 star. Okay, so if we were to uh, think about a three-pointed curve in here with these kind of contact orders, what it means is that we meet D2 transversely at XP, we meet D4 transversely at XQ, uh, and otherwise we, we miss the other divisors. But we then have the fact that we're supposed to have contact order minus one with D1. And that actually forces, I need another color for this, forces any such curve um, to look like this. So we will have the point XP here, the point XQ here. Here, those two points make um, simple contact with D2 and D4, then transversal to D2 and D4. That's obvious from the picture. But somehow the log structure remembers, despite the fact that XP maps into D1, uh, this point is actually at the intersection of D1 and D2, uh, there's no contact or D1. And finally, we have a third point where we have contact order minus one with, uh, with this divisor D1. And the way to think about this is that this curve, so here the curve is class, curve class is uh, A equals D1 and A dot D1 is D1 squared, that's minus one because I started with a curve with self-intersection zero and I blew up a point on it. So what's happening is that somehow the fact that the curve meets D1 uh, to yeah, intersection number minus one, this puncture here can be thought of as saying, well, actually we're going to take all of that minus one and concentrate that in one place. That's kind of an intuition as to what's going on. Uh, if I could actually, if I was working topologically where I could actually perturb this curve 
away from the divisor, it would look something like that, where you would have a point of intersection here, not with intersection number one, but intersection number minus one. Of course, we can't do that algebra geometrically because intersection numbers are always positive if, if transverse. Uh, so somehow the puncture invariants or puncture maps can remember this information. Okay, so there is such a, a curve. Uh, any questions there? Sorry, Mark, I have a question. Actually. Yeah. So um, in this case, right, you, so you treated treat this case as a, a case one or case two, I mean. In, uh, th this is actually um, fits into both cases because Kx plus D is zero. So it's both NAF, anti-NAF and log Claudia. Okay, I see, thanks. Um, okay. So this could be annoying to just tell me if it's annoying. How, how easy it is to just get the classical uh, theta functions on an elliptic curve from this construct? Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's well, I don't know if I should say reasonable. It's not hard to do it. Uh, we have, um, so in, in my paper with, with Berndt and, and Paul Hacking, um, we have a, a chapter where we, we explain how, how the, the classical billion theta function show up. Okay. Uh, for for arbitrary billion varieties, the the language is probably the notation probably simplifies in the elliptic curve case, but it's, it's not dreadfully hard. You you can start with an elliptic curve as your x and take like a bunch of points on this x and just run this construction and somehow you recover the near elliptic curve and some kind of theta function. Uh, okay, so th there's a part I if you're talking about the mirror to elliptic curve. Uh, I I need to talk about, I, I'll get to this a little bit later in the talk, but we need to also talk about degeneration situation. Uh, if I understood the correction, uh, sorry, the question correctly. I, I mean, I, I thought there was, there would be a special case of this construction where the theta function that you constructed are theta, the classical of theta functions. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let me get to that, that point later in the talk. Okay, yes, yes, yeah. um, uh, Okay, so anyway, this is the intuition um, on, um, on the, these puncture curves, uh, just sort of repeating, I mean, I'm probably repeating something Baron said, but maybe this gives a slightly different point of view. But the crucial thing is we do have this modular space. Now, there's actually not that much good I can say about this multi space. It um, doesn't necessarily have a well-defined virtual dimension. Um, but what I can do is I can make it behave better if I put a point constraint on this output point. I need to put point constraint on XR. So let me explain a little bit about how this is done. There's some subtleties. Um, so the problem is, um, well, so there's not a good evaluation map. from this Mondrai space to X at the logarithmic level. So let me make contact with some things that Baron probably talked about. So how would you normally define about an evaluation map? Well, normally you would take the universal curve And um, of course, there is the universal map, the X. And uh, then you could look at a section here corresponding to mark point. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, you can get an evaluation map at the mark point just by taking this composition to get a map like that. The only trouble is that this section doesn't actually exist at the log level. Uh, in general, uh, what's happening, you have the curve uh, over, let's say that you have a curve over a point, which has some monoid. Uh, over here, the monoid generically is Q, but maybe over here is Q plus N or something more complicated if it's a puncture. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to find a section. You need, need some sort of choice of map going this way, which may or may not exist. Uh, and it wouldn't necessarily be very natural. So this is always a problem. Evaluation maps uh, at mark points don't, aren't so simple in logarithmic geometry. Uh, but there is a way of cooking up what's called an evaluation space. However, there exists an evaluation space, which I'm going to write as P of x r for punctures with contact order minus r and an evaluation map uh, from the moduli space m of x beta to P of x r. Now, this uh, evaluation space uh, is a stack rather than a scheme. It's actually, I will have to introduce a bit of notation, it's zr mod gm, where zr is equal to the intersection over all i such that di r is greater than zero of di. So if you want to think of this, r is in the interior of some cone of b, and that cone corresponds to a stratum. This is a stratum corresponding uh, to the cone, the minimal cone of p containing R. Okay, so this action is trivial of GM is trivial on the underlying scheme. That are, but is non-trivial on the log structure. I don't want to go into too many details. The important thing is you can construct this, um, and there is now an evaluation map that plays the role of evaluating at the output point XR. Now, this gives me a chance to, um, to now cons uh, put on a point constraint. Um, and it's slightly difficult simply because we have this extra GM action, but uh, let's not worry too much about that. So given the point Z in ZR, not contained in any deeper stratum, Um, we have uh, a map uh, Z to ZR. So this is just the inclusion, which we can enhance to a logarithmic map.
Now, what will be the log structure? So I'll put on the standard uh, log point structure on, on Z. So we just have the the um, the monoid, the structure sheaf. This is this is the sheaf M. Is just the K star across uh, the the monoid M. Uh, and here we have ZR with the induced log structure from X. And over here we have some monoid. Um, so the stock of, of the, uh, I hope this makes sense. Again, I, I didn't catch Ben's first talk, but the stock of M bar ZR at point Z uh, is just uh, N to the R um, or N to the N to some number N to the K, where this N to the K, this is the dual to uh, the, uh, the the corresponding cone, uh, so dual to the sort of minimal cone containing R dual. Sorry, I didn't really introduce enough good notation for this. And then you but this one is related to the curl the X from band Am I correct this this time? This he will draw picture inside uh, curly X and we have the arrow and the arrow like this is kind of where the arrow is pointing at like something like that right this um, yeah kind of so so this is still not curly so the curly X would probably involve dividing out by by a larger torus um, I think you know you should view this dividing up by GM as saying that we don't really know what the normal bundle at the output point is, and uh, so the the stack so the map to this sort of BGM factor uh, just comes the normal bundle. I don't know if that helps, but what I want to say here is that this map is just given by R. Right, R is an element of the minimal cone containing R, so it defines a map on the dual. So tropically, what's happening? We have this cone. Let me try to draw a three-dimensional cone um, containing the point R, and the image from what Barrett would have written as trop of the point Z to trop that R, the image would be just the ray generated by R. Uh, okay, so you then can divide out by the GM action. We had the GM action here, and we also can put a GM action here that's compatible. But this is the most technical part of the talk. So, I mean, don't worry if, if um, if this isn't so clear, um, uh, it, I'll leave this behind shortly. Uh, so divide up by GM action on both sides, we get a map, BGM to ZR mod GM, which if you recall was this, uh, evaluation space. Uh, okay, so this gives us now a way of, of defining point constraint. Let's define uh, the moduli space with a point constraint, M of X beta R by the Cartesian diagram. Uh, sorry, this should have been a Z here. Okay. 
So this is the map I just explained how to construct here very loosely. This is this evaluation map. We do have an evaluation map from an original modular space to here. And then we just take a fiber product. But I have to emphasize this is in the category of FS log schemes or log stacks, I suppose. Again, I'm not sure whether you've seen the sort of distinction that the fiber product of, uh, of log schemes or more generally log stacks is a complicated story. And the reason is that if you want to stay within the category, say, fine saturated log schemes, uh, the underlying uh, gadget here, this need not be the underlying fiber product of these things. Um, so this is really kind of fairly subtle thing. And what happens tropically, we're not just constraining the, I mean, one way to think about this is that the, if we just did an ordinary fiber product here, all we would be doing is constraining the output point, this XR to match the point Z. But we're doing more than that. We're also making a tropical constraint. So this imposes a tropical constraint. So very roughly, let me draw what maybe BP would look like. And maybe R is here. And uh, maybe we have lots of tropicalizations of puncture maps that might look like this. And the only constraint for a uh, tropical curve appearing as a tropicalization of a curve in this moduli space would be that this arrow here, so this uh, this points in the direction, say R, sorry, uh, P, Q, this points in the direction P, this points in the direction minus R. But this vertex is free to move around. When we put the tropical constraint on, we are now restricting to curves that where this output direction falls inside the ray generated by R. So the only possibility then is something like that. Okay, so we're considering only curves that tropicalize uh, to curves that actually point, uh, have the output ray pointing directly towards the origin in the direction minus R. So this fiber product in the FS category does wonderful things. And in particular, one thing it does for us is that this now has a well-behaved virtual fundamental class. And now I define the numbers that we're aiming for, define uh, NA BQR to be the degree of that virtual fundamental class if uh, the virtual dimension is zero and zero otherwise. Okay, so that's the definition. It, you know, intuitively, you can think of this as saying, we're going to count curves with some specified contact orders at the two input points and a point constraint plus a specified negative contact order at the output point. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Apologies, if it might be slightly bit technical, but um, so when we don't do punctures to define virtual fundamental class, you're looking from your modular space of stable maps uh, to, uh, you consider a map to the modular space of pre-stable log maps to the art in fun, and yeah. when you do just log, this is equidimensional, but when you do puncture, this is not equidimensional. That's right, yeah. Pre-stable yeah. log maps to the art, and what you're doing, if I understand correctly, is 
you are fixing the image of the punctured point in a log way, and this is solving the issue and turns it into a dimensional. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So the okay. crucial thing is that this, um, if I put the art and fan here, curly x instead, this would actually become equidimensional. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay, so um, let me state the main theorem and then because I promised. Um, this is a much more stupid question. So can you, is it possible to say kind of where Z is in terms of PQR? Uh, just a very stupid question. I should uh, uh, so, so where the this point constraint is. Uh, so we can choose it to, it has to align the stratum uh, indexed by R. Right, that was the... Um, yeah, I never understood why. I thought R lived in the pool of the... Okay, yeah, so R lives, uh, so what is R? R lives in B. So it lives in, in a cone in B. Right, B is, is a, a, a union of cones. But it pairs with these, right? It pairs right, with... It Right. So, so this is this is one uh, one way of dividing ZR. So how can R live in one of these things? I don't understand. Um, how can R live in one of these cones? I just like I logically cannot follow it. I thought R lived in like blue. Uh, okay. So so maybe yeah. Let me just go go back. There's the trouble about having so little on the screen at once. Um, where was the um, definition, right? Okay, so um, sigma of X is a set of cones in the dual space. And R and, and B, you know, B is the support, uh, at least in case one is the support of sigma of X. Uh, B always lives, ultimately will live in, um, in uh, div D of X star R. Right, so B lives in the dual, and R, these points P, Q, and R, are um, points in B of Z, so integral points on B. Yes, so, yes. Okay, so, so in particular, you know, B is a, is a union of cones, so it makes sense to ask for what's the minimal cone containing R. Okay, and, but if they don't define divisors, right? P, Q, and R don't define divisors. No, 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 they define intersections of divisors via this, this formula that I wrote down here. Uh, where was it? Here. Uh, so you can take a look at the intersection of those DI such that DI evaluates positively on R. Okay, I, I think now I understand. Okay. Also, okay. oh, Mark. Yeah. Also, I think. Uh, by the way, I th I think that there is a good point for the FS like a uh, fiber product is is once you take FS fiber product. Uh, I mean, if you take a look at the tropical picture, it literally just corresponds to the the fiber product of the tropicalization of the cones. That's right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that comment. Okay, so let me state the, the main theorem. Uh, so the main theorem is that this choice of structure constants turns Ri of Xd into an associative Commutative, commutative is trivial from the definition, commutative uh, AI algebra with uh, multiplicative identity with unit one equals theta zero. Okay, so this. The theorem requires some work. I'm not going to go into the proof, but uh, those of you familiar with ordinary quantum cohomology will, will probably guess that as something somehow the, at the heart of it, there's some similar argument. I want to make sure I get to this issue question about elliptic curves. 
So let me talk about a variation. And this is a degeneration situation. So here we consider, um, let's say, family XD sitting over S, which will be, say, the spectrum of a DVR. Uh, and which we assume is log smooth and uh, a normal crossings, uh, S and C. Okay, so here what we're doing is we're looking not just at pair XD, but we're looking at a whole degeneration of such, so possibly with the central fiber being quite singular. Uh, and D would always include the central fiber. So uh, if zero is the closed point, what we want is we have X zero should be contained in D. Mm -hmm. So let me give a simple example. A degeneration of an elliptic curve to a cycle of rational curve. So this is usually called the Tate curve. And in this case, you would take D would just be the central fiber. Uh, so the general fiber would be elliptic curve with no points, and then the, the special fiber would be this uh, degenerate. Thing. So in this case, you can still go through the same construction. There's nothing, um, uh, you just need the modular spaces to be proper over S, and that, that works as long as this thing is proper or projected. In this case, Ri of xd is actually graded of xd comes with the grading. And we get a mirror family. Uh, by taking Proj. And typically, in this case, you can also go to uh, to the completion. Um, so that would be how you get, in the case of an elliptic curve, you start with a massively impotent degeneration of elliptic curves. Uh, you construct this mirror family. And this mirror family will come with theta functions, these theta p's. And those theta functions will agree, do agree with classical theta functions in that case. But there's nothing in your setup that, uh, that doesn't allow us to work with just uh, by studying many curves, a device around it, right? That's yeah, so generalized what color uh, Right, right, yeah. So, so you, know, you don't necessarily get something particularly useful. So, so let's um, you know, start with your elliptic curve. You have maybe some sum of points there. Now, what's kx plus d in this case? kx plus d is, uh, well, you know, it's, it's maybe p1 plus it's p1, p2, p3. Now, you could apply case one to this, and you're going to get something pretty boring. Uh, what you're going to get is you're going to get, a, when you take the spectrum, you get a union of three affine lines meaning at a point. The other thing you could do is say, well, actually, we're in case two but all of the AIs are positive, in which case we get something even less interesting because we've thrown, th we've thrown all of B out. Um, so we really should think of um, starting with, a, you know, if we, we want to think of the elliptic curves of Yao, we shouldn't add any points to it. But then we don't have enough structure. We have to degenerate. And that's compatible with you know, the expectation from, from the 1990s physics that mirrors of Clavier's correspond to maximum unipotent degenerations. So you start with, you would start say here with a um, maximum unipotent degeneration of Clavier's, take D to just be X zero, and then you get the mirror family. 
But there is also this kind of large volume limit interpretation where you remove a divisor. In, uh, yeah, so that's um yeah, I don't think that yet fits well into this story. I think you don't get anything particularly interesting. Okay. Okay, anyway, that's that's all I wanted to say. Um, yeah. Let's thank uh, our speaker. Any questions from the room? Any questions from the Zoom room? No question? Everyone understands everything? <laughs> yeah. okay. So maybe I, I, I should say, you know, just to encourage questions, um, I will be reusing, and I'm not going to repeat this material, I will be reusing the, the definition of chocolization uh, for my talk tomorrow. So I'm going to assume that everyone is completely on top of uh, chocolization of, of a pair XD. And, and somehow the integral that finds structure on this chocolization. It just doesn't appear anymore. That's right. Yeah. So in this setup, uh, it's completely invisible. But I will need that tomorrow. Oh, sorry, Mark. Yeah, it's all of a sudden I got a question actually in my mind. Yeah. So you in this picture, right? So uh, uh, your torque position is uh, is like a P one cross P one, right? You 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 do a non torque blow up, right? But your chocolateization is still a the P one cross P one, right? In the in the in this case, what what is the uh, iPhone structure or with like a hop, like what iPhone structure you put? Right. So so if we were talking about the iPhone structure, then there would be a singularity at the origin. Yeah. Uh, with modern geometry uh, being something like um, I think the the horizontal thing would be yeah so one one zero one I think. Yeah, you you chose this one because. The, the the exceptional divisor right that's right yeah yeah okay good thanks other questions maybe i could ask you a related question sorry i think uh probably in the ted curve example mark was just saying as a symplectic geometer you're probably thinking if you look at the cycle of rational curves a symplectic geometer would say its mirror is the elliptic curve with some points remote, because if you look at the Foucault category of the elliptic curve with some points remote, it would be the mirror to the rational curve. But I don't know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware if there is any way we could uh, see the data of um, those points remote in the setup that we are working yeah. with. Yeah, actually, there, I'm just thinking there might be might be a way of doing it. Um, yeah, the, I, I, I think I would have to think a bit, but um, yeah, this yeah. vaguely rings a bell that uh, there might be a way of doing it. Okay, um, thank you. No, I think, uh, I think isn't it, uh, we, we have the polarizing class on, um, on the mirror to the Tate curve and what symplectic geometers remove is is the ample divisor, which would be, which would give a section of the mirror degeneration that intersects a smooth fiber in a bunch of points. I think that's true. Uh, I see. So in that case, we would think of the. Uh, well, but we want don't we want the A model? So so the the. Variety with minus the points should be a model, right? Yeah, but in the, I mean, if you talk about the Foucault category, you still want the, you want to take, as Umut said, right, this large volume limit. And for that, you need the polarization. Yeah. And crank up the volume. I think that's what, what brings in these points. But the construction has to go this way, has to start from uh, um, 
No, I disagree. That's a that's a complex degeneration. I, I would really want to hear that you disagree, and someone tells me uh, those questions. I think somebody might have, I feel like again somehow it didn't work. I mean, you can you can use the Tate curves, this 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 degeneration, this no of a nodal elliptic curve, and not change the symplectic structure at all, right? You make this, you remove the center fiber. Okay, you have a day twist, but other than that, it's it's a pretty boring family. Let's say you go along a real uh, half real real half line. You could you could make this symplectically trivial. So I think the, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's certainly ways to integrate it as a mirror base, I mean, on the base, but this is really a complex parameter uh, in the beginning. Um, yeah, maybe uh, it's worth thinking about if if, if um, we figure out by, by tomorrow, then. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's thank uh, Mark uh, one last time. Thank <laughs> you.